Welcome. Today, I've got a treat for you. It's an experiment, really. We've never had this many guests on at one time. There's five of us today. We wanted to give you an intimate look inside the minds of everyday men, the burdens we carry, the struggles we face, and the deeper aspirations that we strive to realize in our lives. Our guests today are professionally successful men, one a doctor, one an engineer, the other a software tech entrepreneur. They're family men, most married, one divorced, and between the five of us, we span decades. We got one man in his 30s, another in his 40s, two of us in our 50s, and the last in his early 60s. And all of the men in this episode today, including my co-host Tate and I, at one point in our past came to the same profound and essential realization that we cannot continue lone wolfing it through life, trying to figure everything out all by ourselves. And we need to figure out how to consistently surround ourselves with trustable, growth-oriented men to do life with. And so the five of us, along with seven other men, we've been doing deep work together for the last six months in Elevate 2024, my year-long deep dive coaching adventure for men. This episode shares the stories of men who were stuck in some painful way in their lives, unsure how to move forward, and who took courageous action despite doubts and resistance to create new possibilities for themselves. And as you listen, if you're a man and you're ready to elevate your life in the ways that are most meaningful to you, consider joining me for Elevate 2025. We're now accepting applications at brianreeves.com slash elevate. It's brian with a Y, reeves.com slash elevate. We only accept 10 men into this year-long coaching journey, which begins soon. And you could be one of those men. Again, it's brianreeves.com slash elevate. All right. Now take a deep breath and stay present with us all the way through to the end of this episode of Men This Way. Welcome to Men This Way. All right, everybody, welcome to Men This Way. And when I say everybody, I mean we got five men on the line today, including myself. Uh, Tate, welcome to you, as always. Thank you, brother. Good to see you, as always. This is, this is our podcast now. This is exciting to see these guys here. It is exciting. We've got, we have a conversation amongst five men today. Uh, Tate, let's set up the context for what we're doing here today. Yeah, you know, look, wow, today's a, a conversation with three of the 10 men that are a part of the Elevate 2024 experience, but this really isn't a, a conversation about Elevate 2024. This is really a conversation about what men are holding in the world and the impact that really men's work can have on them. Um, y y all of these men, um, all of all of men are dealing with challenges, challenges that we face in the world. You know, these by and large, what we have a tendency to do is work with men who are on the hamster wheel of their lives. They, they have the house, the car, the boat, the kids, the, the jobs, the businesses, the success that externally uh, people would see and, and, and laud and, and really celebrate. And yet all of us men are holding things in the world that that when we hold it alone, we really struggle. We live in a context where most of us men uh, have, have struggled to have a lack of trustable elders, and we have had a lack of trust in other men and, and even other women for that matter. So today is a conversation with, with five, between five men about what it's like to be a man in the world and really the importance that the impact that that men's work can have in the world in our world and you know why, why don't we just get started and we'll have the men have you guys introduce yourself you know tell us about yourself your name what kind of work do you do just just bring us into into your world and we'll do it like we always do which is you know popcorn style and i'll jump in first so my name is jeff wright uh i live in utah i work as a software engineering director and i am a father of five uh kids four boys one girl and um i guess last bit uh, i've been divorced for two years welcome jeff glad you're here man thank you 
I'm Jamie Bruffy. I'm a orthopedic surgeon out here in San Diego, California. I have two boys, both adult kids, uh, 29 and 28. Been married for 33 years. Um, started my work with you guys about a year and a half ago. So good to be here. Glad to see you, Jamie. Welcome. I'm going to try something different because normally I would say I'm Scott Sylvie and I uh, am a software entrepreneur. But what I am is I'm a, I'm a father of four children and a husband to a beautiful wife. Um, I live in Tennessee. Um, I've got four kids, uh, about to turn nine, my oldest, seven, five, and five. Um, and my wife, uh, Kelly, we've been together. Well, we met 23 years ago, and this marriage has been 12 years. We were also married for about eight months um, in a, uh, before what we call the Dark Ages um, as 22-year-olds. Um, yeah, and then after all that stuff, I'm a, I'm a software entrepreneur. Welcome, Scott. Yeah, glad to have you. Uh, you know, I want to set this up this way as well. Uh, Tate, do you, do you remember, did you see that image that I sent you from? I took a screenshot of this so so i was at a conference that that jamie the this orthopedic surgeon conference this past weekend i was speaking about relationships and the woman that opened the conference was a woman uh, a, a harvard professor i think a doctor harvard professor who was sharing her story about the burdens that doctors carry and the this you know, suicide rates depression all of that and she shared this one quote that we've said it differently, but but the way that she shared it really touched me. It said, just because someone carries it well doesn't mean it isn't heavy. Just because someone carries it well doesn't mean it isn't heavy. You know, Jamie, I took a screenshot that uh, of that and sent that to Tate, or a screenshot, you know, of her presentation. I took a picture of it on my phone. Because you know what we're one of the things that we we want to explore with you men today is is you know you guys are all all of us all five of us on this in this conversation are are successful men at least by by society standards right by the external standards of things we we look like we got all the things that that that's that a man could want and in my estimation right you know you, you three men in particular before we all dove into this work together. You know, you look like men that, that were just holding it all together and not that you weren't, obviously you were, I mean, to, to hold what you're holding. <laughs> yeah. I see the, as soon as I say that, I see the heads kind of boy like, well, yeah, but, eh. but all right, let's just start there. Right. What, what, what just came up for you? Even as I was saying, yeah, that? appearances are deceiving, Brian. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, I think of Sisyphus pushing the rock up the hill. You know, getting crushed by it as it rolls back down and you kind of slump way your way back down to the bottom of the hill to start pushing it back up the hill. That's kind of what life, at least for me, certainly felt like uh, in certain facets, right? In certain facets. Yeah. Yeah. Certain facets. I would agree with, uh, with what Jamie said there with, you know, the exception for me being, you know, I would love to be in a relationship again at some point and right now i'm not so that's the part of my life that uh you know i guess has catapulted me into this idea of like maybe there's something better maybe i need to go out and explore more and understand even though i may have all of these trappings of success how do i really have a fulfilled life how, how long jeff had you been divorced or or where were you in that process last year now yeah, it was like crushing loneliness is how i would describe it um, it was that knowledge that, uh, you know, like I, I was still showing up for work, still, still doing all that stuff, uh, still holding life together, taking care of my kids, taking them off on road trips, going to different places. Um, and at the same time in my internal world, just recognizing that, uh, I had prioritized all of the wrong things. And I'm starting to make that change. I'm starting to make that change by, you know, doing these road trips with my kids instead of just sitting at home all day and trying to convince them not to spend all their lives on screens while I don't actually spend any time with them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Wow. Crushing loneliness. Damn. <clears throat> yeah, I can relate to that. Scott. Yeah, for me, it was, um, you know, I, to, to echo what everyone else is saying externally, 
you know, I've got a nice house. I've got, you know, a happy family. I've got, you know, a good career, all those things. Um, there were many, many times over the last five years where I would ask my wife if we're friends and she would say, I can't answer that. And so for all the, the ways I knew how to advance myself in certain areas of my life, I didn't know how to advance my relationship with my wife and my kids and ultimately myself as well. Um, and so that was, that's why I was like going back and forth is <laughs> I had some things yeah. figured out. Right. But yeah. for all, for all of, of that, I, I didn't know how to navigate the most important relationship in my life, which is the most important aspect of my life as well. Yeah. You know, what I'm just so struck by is like, you know, again, we've been, you know, we've been doing some deep, deep work all together, right? All of us for the last at least six months, Jamie, we've been working with you longer and, and like, we're, we're smart dudes. We're intelligent men, right? We're smart. I mean, engineer, right? Jeff, you're an engineer. We got a surgeon, uh, Scott, you're a, I mean, you're a, you're a, you're a businessman in tech, you know, you're one of the most savvy, savviest people I know in that sense. And, and, you know, Tate, I mean, I've known you for 40 years, right? I got a master's degree. You have an MBA, like we're smart dudes. And yet each of us hit walls. Repeatedly. Repeatedly. And usually alone. Alone. That's, I think that's, that's a key. Tate, say more about that. Well, I, you know, one of the, there's, there's two themes that we that Brian and I that brought us powerfully into creating this experience and and just doing more work together in the world. The two things were the the presence and knowing that most men don't have trustable elders, men that have come before them, fathers, uh, you know, mentors that have really helping guide us to to live life in in all the ways that really matter to us there might be men that are that are doing really well in business but their marriage is falling apart there are mother might be some men that their marriages are doing fine but they have no idea how to be a father in the ways that they need to they might have a man that's a great father but his health is falling apart and he has no idea how to show up for his own needs and desires like there's we, there's a lack of trustable elders and we that's the adage, like the way that men wear masks, we, we paint our faces the best way we know how, and we leave a trail of tears behind for the people that love us the most. And it's not because we don't want to do better. It's that we don't know how to do better. And, and the way we try to do better is just put our foot on the gas pedal alone in the car by ourselves, uh, careening in life and just trying to hold it all together. Yeah. Tate, what comes up for me in this conversation is, the immense amount of shame I felt around failure where I was failing, which paralyzed me into doing anything to fix it. I was ashamed, so ashamed to admit that there was failure and struggle that I sat in. I just stay there because I, who was I going to tell? Like, who, I'm so ashamed. Like, I can't tell anybody this is a complete, absolute failure and I'm miserable here. I was ashamed of and that's why I I doubled down on career because if I could just have more success in career, then it would mask or obfuscate, you know, a lot of the the other shortcomings. Like I'm I'm good enough as a result of this one thing, even if the rest of it is falling apart. Yeah, I I think you know again, Jamie, I'm coming off of that conference, so I just I got a, a real great insight into the world of of doctors and surgeons and 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 the and the burdens that that y'all are carrying silently. And what I what I was really struck by too is. I mean, the stakes of, of so-called failure, you know, even just admitting that I'm struggling, you know, the, the stigma of mental health. I mean, you know, I think as a, as a, as a man, like who's going to want to work with me if I don't look like I have it all together? Nobody, <laughs> right? I'm not going to be able to earn income if I don't look like I have it all together. Right. In any of our professions, really. I mean, from mine, from coaching to, 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 to doctor, to engineer, it's like the stakes, like we have to look like we have it all figured out. And there's that, that quote, uh, that it's lonely at the top, the high, the greater, the successes that we have in one area, the, the, the harder it is for us to actually reveal the vulnerabilities that we feel in the other areas of our life that aren't working out as well as we want them to, because we've got to keep pretending 
that we've got it all together, hiding the fact that we feel insecure, that we feel vulnerable, or that we feel lonely, or that we feel hurt, or we feel not enough, or we feel we're afraid that we're not going to be loved, or like all of those things just kick in. And, and the, it's lonely at the top because part of the story that we have is that there's, there's no one that can really help us hold this. Yeah. This, this container and the other men, I think would agree just based on our recent experience and our time together, the relief that I feel being able to bring this stuff to you guys, all of you, all 10 men in my group and you, you guys as, as the leaders of the group, but just the relief that you don't have to sit with this by yourself, that you can bring it here is so immense and so freeing. You know, we talk about what the masculine looks for freedom. <laughs> Who would have thought that bringing your stuff to 10 guys is freeing, but it's, it's amazingly free, right? Yeah. You know, I, I, as you speak about that, I think of the, uh, is it Catholicism? They have confession. You know, you can go sit in a booth and just confess to some faceless voice on the other side of a divide, you know, and it's like, okay, they're tapped into something there. I, I, I've actually never done confession, but there, this, this witnessing there, there is a, a, a profound relief that I, you know, I, I, we get to experience in, in being able to witness each other, be witnessed by other men. I, that leads me to a question. I'm curious. When did it first, you know, you guys come together at the beginning of this year. Again, Jamie, you'd been with us a little longer in, in our Elevate Your Relationship work. So you, you had a taste of this already. But I'm like, when did it first start to click? Like, okay, this is different. This is interesting. Like this, like, you know, if you, men come together, we're sizing each other up. At least this is how it works for me. I'm like, okay, I'm in a, a, a room full of new men. Who are these motherfuckers? I don't know if I can trust you. <laughs> you know, what is this? Who are these people? You know, and I suspect that most men bring that that kind of of guard into into a dynamic. What like did bring us into your early days of this? Like when it's first started clicking that okay, there's this is uh, I can I can maybe put my guard down. I can trust a little here. Well, I think for me, um, you know, one of the things I said at the very beginning was that y'all were 10 strangers in the internet, right? Or 11 strangers in the internet. So I had two choices, right? I, I had made a, a commitment to this program for a year. So my choices were to either just go all in or stay on the fringes, but I, I didn't do this to stay on the fringes. So I was just, I basically just jumped in and started sharing shit that I had never talked about with anybody. Um, and so for me, like, Initially, it was fine because you were just strangers on the internet. And so I wouldn't care if, if I just got uncomfortable and bowed out, like, okay, fine. Like there's now 11 people who know a little bit about me that I'm probably never going to see again. So it's no big deal. But even before you said this, Jamie, I had written down that I had never really been able to show up fully as myself anywhere. Um, and I, so as a result, I'd never really been able to explore myself. And so for me, it was as I started sharing some of these things and observing other people sharing courageously vulnerable right things that 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 was pretty quick for me to when this light bulb went off of like all right this is there's something here that's more than just you know a men's group like what what you kind of classically hear on the internet of just oh it's a men's group no it's more than that i'm gonna echo what scott said um for me it does feel like uh this felt like a different men's group pretty early on um, I, I've tried going to other men's groups, uh, some local ones, some that you, you know, go pay and do online kind of similar to this, but, uh, one of them was just incredibly uninspiring. Um, <laughs> when I thought about it, it reminded me of, uh, I'm ex Mormon, but like we have elders quorum every week on Sundays and it's an hour long. And so many times, especially in Utah. That's just like a group of guys that get together and are half checked out while there's some dude reading a lesson manual at the front of the class. And that's the hour, right? Like there is so much potential there for connection and for what we do in that room. Right. But like nobody's really there. Like there's maybe two or three guys that'll pay attention and engage. And so that's what that men's group experience has been like for me growing up through church was a lot of that. And then this men's group felt very similar. 
and then other men's group where people just kind of show up inconsistently and they aren't really all in. Um, and so I think that's where this uh, Elevate group stood out differently for me. Um, and it's even in their check-in process, right? Like here and all in. Always, always reiterating that like, hey, I'm here. Yeah, for me, it's been, you know, I've said this before in our, in our, our groups, um, this transformational process, you know, to, and to watch even in the six, seven months that we've been together with uh, our group, uh, watching myself transform, but also watching the men in this group, like I have two of them here and you guys have transformed in front of me with me. It's, it's been, um, you know, it's, it, I, it's Scott, it's funny. I'm glad you went first because I thought Scott was the guarded one, like 10 dudes on the internet, right? You know, yeah. And, uh, and it's, <laughs> I think you would agree, Scott, it's way more than that. Now. It is way more than that so yeah it is transformational um like i said and they're probably it's you know there's lots of reasons um but it's there's freedom there's uh safety there's all the things that have a space like this to be able to bring our stuff to where we're not alone um is just amazing so yeah you maybe use this really you know this this word that means a lot transformation and one of the first questions that i ask you guys when we have a the the call to figure out whether or not there's a good fit right uh, it, it is and I, I want you all to bring us back to to that thing that you really wanted to have transformed what was that thing what was the number one thing that you wanted or needed to experience in order for your life to be transformed because in many ways that's the promise that gets made when you when you join an experience like this that that there is something that is that is unrecognizable that's in your future and and we've got a container to help walk men through it. But what what do you know that you need to experience in order in order for at the end of this experience for you to have said, man, this was worth it. It was worth the time, the energy, the effort, the resources that it was going to take me to dive all in. What was that one thing for you guys? Yeah, I, I'll go first. Uh, you know, for me, it was the definition of my worth being defined by something other than me. This external whether it's relationship or work or all the things that, you know, without those things and relationship was one of the big things, right? Was the definition that I was unworthy and my base core without that being a pro without that being a good thing. And to be able to bring that internal, that's, that was what was transformational for me was the ability to bring my sense and my definition of worth that I defined. Nobody else did. Nothing else did was transformational for me. As you share that, Jamie, I, I noticed that that in myself as well. Over the years, as I've been <clears throat> doing men's work and surrounding myself as with trustable men, as as we like to say it, and I've seen that even in in our group this year, how there's this shift of of a lot of us men, we get our sense of worth or value from the women in our lives. You know, so long as she approves of me, then I must be okay in some way. You know, and, and boy, how reliable is that? <laughs> not much, right? That's just, it's like the changing winds, you know, today it's blowing out of the South tomorrow. It's blowing out of the North. And, and so, yeah, I've seen that as well, that, that shifting focus, like, wow. Okay. So being surrounded by trustable men, oh, she, she can go through her moods. She can, or I can be single and alone and not have a woman necessarily to validate me. But I, like, I got these men that are witnessing back to me all of the things from, from the, the places I need to be challenged and though the, and the places where I need to be celebrated as a man in the way that I'm showing up. So that, that's, I think that's really profound. Thank you, Jamie. I'll uh, jump in next. One of the things I was really looking for is confidence. Um, I underlying that I think was a recognition or maybe I didn't understand what it was at the time, but a fear of, advocating for myself. Um, I often came at problems from the side. If there was something that, um, that I wanted, I really struggled to go and take care of it myself. But if I found someone else who wanted what I wanted, I could somehow justify going for it kind of through them, you know, like using someone else to get to the thing that I want to get to. Um, that was okay. I, I, I don't know how that makes sense, but, um, 
Yeah. So being able to understand like, what was at the root of that? Like what, what kept me from feeling like it was okay for me to have emotions, to have problems, to have, um, needs and just be able to be empowered to go and get them taken care of on my own. Yeah. Which you remind me of Jeff is, you know, our, our two greatest fears, which is that we're not enough and that we won't be loved. And that, that what, what you're speaking to here is the, the power that gets filled inside of us when we're willing to actually put our fears on the table and not pretend that we don't have them. You know, that, that you saying, I don't have, I, I, I was afraid that I didn't have the confidence in the world that I needed in order to go live a big life. And for your willingness to say that. That's the beginning of where power starts to get fueled back in our life rather than putting on the bullshit. I'm, I'm good. I'm not afraid of anything. I got all the confidence I need underlying that is like this fear that, Oh, I, am I really enough? What if, what if I do this thing and I'm not going to get loved and you stating, man, this, and, and that's, what's, that's the beginning of when transformation happens is when men identify what's the thing. What's that one thing that if I were to transform, it could have a ripple effect into every aspect of my life in and of itself. It is acknowledging that by myself, I'm actually not enough. But if I surround myself with other men that are actually up to something, maybe I could get the fuel I need to know that, you know what, in some cases I'm going to be enough. In other cases, I'm not going to be enough, but I'm not going to be alone in this. And I I think Tate, another way that gets translated in men too is, well, if I'm, if I, if, if I'm not going to be loved, if, if I can't get this right, whatever, then you know what? Fuck it. I don't need love. Right. right I don't need right. people. I don't need anybody. I, I got me and that's all I need. Right. We, we go into that, that dead end path of, of cynicism and isolation yeah. and we can yeah. succeed in all kinds of ways, but sure. there's kind of a fuck you to the world attitude about it. You know, I'm gonna get mine and yeah, damn to the rest. Yeah. Scott, what's this bringing up for you? I think for me, what I was really looking for originally was knowing, right? Like, so I've done men's work. I know the concept of different pillars and I knew that my relationship pillar was, was lagging. Right. And I, and I mentioned this earlier that that was the big thing I was looking for was how to fix that. But I think as I've gone through this process and really dug into who I am, uh, I, I recognize that what I was really looking was for the validation that if, if this one pillar, like, if I could solve this, then, then I'm good enough. Then I'm enough. Then I'm, I'm successful. Then I've won. And one of the things that, uh, I've been reflecting on a lot lately is this idea of, you know, feeling like I arrive when X happens, but X is never going to happen. There's always going to be another X. And so instead, you know, it's it, what, what I've realized I'm looking for is how do I just show up for me? Right. We talk about in the group, we've got this common theme that's come up of A plus B equals C. A is me, B is my partner, C is our relationship. And I came in thinking that I needed to solve C. And what I've learned and what I realized is that what I actually need to do is really just solve me. Because I can't control B, to your point, Brian. And I can't, I, I, I don't want to control B. And I also can't control C, right? To I, I know you talk about, Brian, that it's not a 50-50 proposition in relationship. It's 100-100. And so if I'm going to go 100, that's all I can control. And if I want to get to the 200 on C, well, hopefully what I'm doing in A is enough to, you know, help my wife if, if she's needing some help. Maybe just me showing up for me will be the inspiration for her. But that's ultimately what I, what I came in looking for was an improvement in C, an improvement in my relationship to get that validation. And I think what I've realized is that all I can really control and all I should want to control is how I'm showing up for me. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I'm, you know, we're, we're talking about men's groups and I think one of the, one of the things, because we're having a conversation about, about men's groups is this idea about masculinity. Like what, what does that even mean? And, you know, you hear that this term like toxic masculinity, which is not a term that I love because I know that there can, there are toxic men and there are toxic women. And, and th- that's just a part of our, our, of our culture is that there's some really unhealthiness that's out there. And what I'm curious to hear about from you is you guys is, you know, how has your perception of masculinity changed 
since you've been doing this work? What what is that term? What did that term mean? What does it mean to you now? It is what, what what do you see in that? What I always thought of as masculinity was definitely more on that scale of hyper masculinity. That you know, super alpha male, go out there, crush it, kill it every day. You know, just go fuck the woman, do the thing, go to whatever. You know, just like taking it, like Ryan was saying before, just get yours, man. Kill it, fuck it, stab it, conquer it. Just do whatever, it, do it to it. You are you are a stoic mountain that just does it. Yep, that, that's that's what I saw as masculinity. And so in a lot of ways, like I think that definitely contributed to my uh, always struggling to feel accepted around other men. Because in order to be accepted around other men, I felt like I had to be like that and I didn't want to. Yeah, Jeff, is it, it comes up for me, this, this saying we're hearing now, we hear it in a really like, fuck your feelings, right? Does that mean I have to fuck mine too? Because I have them. <laughs> so, so if I have to be in denial of yours, do I also have to be in denial of mine? Because that kind of sucks because I have them still. So yeah, this, this thing doesn't work. I mean, when you apply it to yourself, you're like, shit, well, what do I do with mine? Yeah, it's 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 funny you say this. Like, it's it's say fuck your feelings without feeling anything. I, I'm definitely that archetype historically of the lone wolf, right? Like, I, I was un unwi completely unwilling to ever seek help, counseling, guidance, um, because it was my job to figure it out on my own. Right? Like, I, I couldn't explore myself, my feelings, especially if those were in the way of progress, right? Of moving forward at the advancement of all else. Um, so I, I think that was how I viewed it was, you know, we, we, we have these, these heroes, right? These, these lone wolf assassin type heroes that are, are raised up so highly in our society. And I, I fell for that hook, line and sinker. Like that was what it was to be a man was to figure it out on your own because a real man doesn't need help from other people. You know, I'm, I'm also struck just knowing your men's stories and they're not my stories to tell, so I won't tell them, but our connections to our fathers, <clears throat> right? I know all of us in some way grew up without it tape presence this at the very beginning. We talk about this a lot, the lack of, of, of wise, trustable elders in our lives, you know, and this idea of masculinity, like I, I was, I was kind of caught between two models of masculinity, the, the weak impotent pushover guy and the terrifying fear wielding tyrant right those two extremes of 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 masculine expression and and you know jeff you said earlier like i i didn't i didn't want to be you didn't want to be the tyrant right the guy that's just out there fucking it killing it crushing it destroying it whatever and feeling nothing about it Right. Well, I didn't want to be the impotent one either. Like neither of those. I felt very paralyzed in my masculinity. And I'm curious to hear from you men because, you know, my whole experience of masculinity is in some fascinating way been a f actually a fusion of those two together. <laughs> and I don't, I, you know, I don't want to tell my version of this. I really want to hear from you guys how, what's shifted for you in that regard as to, you know, how, how has masculinity taken on a new, I don't know, definition or a new experience for you men through this? And, and maybe how does that, if you want to share anything about that, that, that relationship to, to father, to, you know, elder man when you were a child, right? And how you're transmuting that into something else. Yeah, for me, um, my, my dad was, was more on that, uh, weak linking uh, archetype. And so, you know, as, as far as, you know, showing me how to take my own ground, like, I don't know, I don't think he's taking his stone still. And so what happened for me, you know, kick it off with this divorce, me trying to go on my journey, figure out, okay, like, what the hell am I doing in my life? And I read the book, King Warrior, Magician Lover. And that is like the first time in my life that I'm introduced to some kind of framework for what masculinity actually could be. Um, and so since 
reading that book and then starting to study other books around masculinity, getting into this uh, Elevate program, diving in more into these <clears throat> ideas of the archetypes of King, Warrior, Magician, and Lover. Um, now what I see as as what it is to be a masculine man is to have range, is to be able to um, develop yourself so that you have the skills that you need to meet the moment as it arises. Um, and I, yeah, like that, that's a masculinity that resonates with me. Yeah, Jeff, I, I, I had the same experience with my father, the, the passive accepting of all things coming his way, uh, conflict avoidant, um, yeah, just to, to make things go smoothly. That's what I, that's what I learned too. And why I took those traits and then brought them into my adult life and, you know, pretty much got destroyed in the process. And, but in, in the other, the flip side of things, the thing I've come to realize is those, those passive conflict avoidant tendencies also hurt the very people I was trying to avoid conflict with my, you know, my partner, my relationships, it ended up being hurtful rather than helpful at the end of the day, which is the paradox, right? Here you are trying to accommodate and what you're really doing is creating, you know, pain and suffering, which you, you, you feel badly about now that, now that I know this, I, I, I feel really badly about it. But the understanding of this, as you pointed out, Jeff, this, this ability to have range and just to, in where for me, where it comes to now, this masculinity thing is to just be in the experience Does this, whatever comes. I can handle it, accept it, and acknowledge it, and be within it, and and it's going to be okay. And that's what's come up for me in this doing this work and being in this process is that's what I've learned is I'm okay, and 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 as a result, I'm showing up differently. So that's that's the experience I'm having is this for the first time now when I'm just being where I thought that would be a terrible thing to do is actually the way. And the people that are around me see me differently because of my kids, my spouse. You, you know, you all are just sharing so many powerful things. And, you know, part of it is like these hopes and these dreams and the things that we hope to get when we do this work, right? There's the remnants of our past. And then there, you know, one of the things that I think we got this, this language from Francis Weller, which is in order for us to elevate, we must first to descend, and so we spend a lot of important time doing dissension work, but it's for the purpose of elevating something. You know, Brian and I named the program Elevate for a reason, and every man is trying to elevate something. And so I'm, what I'm curious about is what has surprised you, you men most about, about your journey in, in Elevator and this men's group again, what is qualitatively different in your life now that you have this group of men doing life with? My, my answer to the previous question was really around just knowing that I have confidence that I, I'm capable of handling that, which comes my way on any given day now, right? Like the ups, the downs, and that confidence doesn't just come from my own experiences of being able to handle things because there's still a lot of life to be lived and a lot of life that I haven't experienced. And just knowing that when I run across those things that maybe I'm not fully capable of handling on my own. I now have a space, a container that I can bring this to, to seek counsel from men who I know are showing up for themselves. They're doing the work. And so they're, you know, it's so often in life, I was actually having this conversation with my wife on our, our, our on our drive recently. People just offer advice, whether or not it's, it's being asked for or whether or not they're qualified to offer that advice. And, and I think when you, when you do this work with trustable men, you like when I need advice, I, I know that I'm going to get worthy advice that's going to be considerate of me and my situation. And, and so I think that's probably the biggest outcome is my, my confidence in knowing I'm capable of handling what comes my way doesn't just come from a rational self-confidence. It comes from knowing that I have that trustable brotherhood that I can fall back on in times of need, which I've never had before. Wow. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, that's just so interesting as you're saying that. It really lit up for me. Like, I have other men in my life, but, you know, in my family system, but I don't go to them for wisdom because they're not doing their fucking work. They don't have the wisdom I seek. So anyway, it's just, it, you just made that, that connection for me. Well, and, and the modeling, right, we get as a result of watching other men navigate their challenges. 
right? Like I didn't have much modeling at any level of my life growing up, you know, around the positive struggles of life and communication and relationships. Yeah, Scott t touches on this and, and really talks to the brotherhood created within this space, the, the, the word trustable. You know, you can bring your suffering, you can bring your question, you can bring your sadness, you can bring the, anything, right? The thing, you bring the thing here and you know you're going to get feedback. Uh, nobody's going to try and fix you. And they're going to listen and you know they care. We, we've created that. You know, we've created a space here. Uh, where you can bring this stuff now and it's safe and the feedback you're going to get is helpful, right? Sometimes it's just to be able to share it, right? So for me, you know, and then watching the group transform around that has been, you know, really, as you guys say all the time, enlivening, elevating. It is that. I mean, it's, you know, we've watched, you know, I watched, and we watched this group transform in this space and uh, I, I I can't think of anybody in the group who wouldn't probably echo this and say, yeah, I can bring my stuff here and I feel okay about doing it. This is a safe container for me to bring my stuff. Yeah. Thank you, Jamie. Jeff, anything come up for you inside this? Uh, some similar things. So I mentioned before with, uh, you know, me wanting to gain confidence, right? And uh, one of the recognitions that I've had as I've gone through this program is that um, I didn't believe that my own stories, my own experiences, the things that I shared had any real value to others. And so like, how are you going to have confidence going out into the world when you don't even feel, you know, a value in the experiences you're having day to day. Um, and so being in this group, being witnessed by these men and getting the feedback time and time again, when I shared things like, Hey, that was actually really helpful for me in this way. Um, oh, hey, you know, that, uh, that thing that you shared, you know, that I just laughed, you know, even something as simple as that, um, recognizing that the stories that I share, um, you know, bring value, they bring joy, they bring insight, whatever it is to the other men in this group, and that I have something that I can bring and contribute in this community that we're building. Um, and that, that fills me with confidence. You know, I, I'm I'm so uh, moved actually by by the answers that you all have given because a lot of times men, you know, we know this, men join a program so that they can have something truly tangible. I want to heal my relationship, or I want to go through a, I want to get through the divorce, make or I want to make more money, or I want to become a better father. These tangible things, and. I'm looking at the men that are on and those tangible things. And we'll ask you maybe in a moment, just as a follow-up, but there are some real fucking tangible things that have actually come alive for you men that are online for each of you men in ways that men would be like, Oh fuck, I want more of that. And what, all of your all's answers were, were not about the tangible things. It was the intangible of, oh, having more confidence in the world, knowing that my story matters, having trustable people around me, knowing that whatever comes my way, I don't have to hold it alone. I, I'll be with other men that can do it. Like imagine now having that be the foundation and then you can actually go out and do the tangible shit in ways that actually has those things come to life. Having those things come to life and not having those things just has men go want to get more of those things because it wasn't fulfilling enough. They got the car, they got the girl, they got more money. Those things came alive and then they need to go get more of it because what the, the hole that men are trying to fill with those things never gets filled and you all are filling it. And now those things can be even more impactful. I'm, I'm thinking about like, tangibly what is what's happening in your relationships not inside this group of men but what's happening in your relationships in the world well, what comes up for me there is i can't imagine anything more tangible than feeling like i matter <laughs> you know finally oh my god yeah jeff you said it right like you know you matter because we have given you that feedback time and time again because you do and i like t t this idea that you could take, you nailed it, right? All the other things we surround ourselves with, right? The things we think make us matter don't really make us matter. But here I finally feel like I do. And uh, that, that's been probably the greatest gift of this work in this space for me is I know I matter. 
Well, and and I've, I've shared this within our group, but um, it, it was actually when we were at our retreat last month, one of the gentlemen was talking about how he felt like he lived small. And I see a fucking monster of a man when I look at that man. And right immediately after that was Jeff describing that he felt like what he thought or that when he shared it wasn't going to be interesting, it wasn't going to be received well, it wasn't going to be impactful. And I, I, I've said it before, I'll say it, I hang on that dude's every word. Right. Like as a father, he models the shit out of being an amazing father to me. And his experience in life is is phenomenal for helping me navigate things. And so to, to your point, Jamie, it was really other people. It, it was initially other people telling me that I matter, that I'm worth it, made me feel worth it. But then it was just a realization of if we all have these different, you know, we call them masks, right? If we all have these masks or or these blind spots rather for ourselves. And, and I see this one gentleman saying he lives small. It's like Brother King, you're not small. And I see another man say, what I have to say isn't worth it. Brother King, what you have to say is worth it. Well, then for me, it was like, well, why would I be the special case, right? Why would my blind spots not matter? Or, or, or you know, why would I not matter as a result? And so I think what you said, Jamie, is accurate that there are, tan- I, know, I know you had a question about tangible things, Tate, and I, I certainly can speak to those. But I also want to echo what Jamie uh, said that, you know, really for me, it's it's not that it's not that other people say I, I, I'm, I'm worth it or that I'm valuable. It's that I, I now know that I am. And it's, it's, and that comes from me, not from anybody else. And so that is tangible as fuck for me. Like that was a huge blocker for my progress in life. Yeah. And, and Tate, for me to then, to take it to your question of how does it now show up outside in my other relationship? I don't need them to define that I matter before I needed the external, my relationships to define that I matter because I could do that internally. Now I don't need it. So the ability to show up differently is I feel the difference in those in that because I don't need that external definition of my worth or my that I matter coming from there. So it's it's profound how that feels for me. Oh, well, I was just going to uh, throw out there one of the most uh, poignant examples that I can think of uh, of the tangible gift of this uh, has been in some of these uh, conversations that I've been able to have with my kids. Um, My oldest is 13 years old. Um, So I didn't really get started into this work and in discovering my own self until he was like 11. And so most of that time of his life, I have been terrified of being vulnerable because being vulnerable would have just destroyed me. And, and so now for the last couple of years to be able to go up to my kid and to share something like, you know, doing mindset work and saying something like, you know, sometimes I get stuck in this loop where I try to get up and out of bed and go do a workout. And then I think about like, I've got all these things to do and, and just get stuck in this loop. And then I don't, I waste an hour stuck in a loop in my head, you know, and being able to share that with my kid and then him being like, Oh, I do that sometimes too. And like, we totally connect on that and he's able to see that that's not like a weird thing that he does, but that's a, that's a thing that we all deal with. And for him to be able to feel comfortable bringing his vulnerabilities forward, because he sees that from me, like to me, that means, that means everything is father. And how old is he? He's 13. 13. I mean, he's, he's, he's entering one of the most challenging stages of, of life. Right. As a teenager, a teenage boy. It's also, it's also a time when just do just physiologically, right. Boys are getting flushed with more testosterone. We tend to shut down emotionally. We tend to become less descriptive in our, how we describe our friendships. You know, when we're, when we're nine, we can say, oh, I love my friend. When we're 14, we can't really say that anymore. It's weird. Right. And all kinds of other it's misogynistic slang. Well, at 40, I can tell all four of you that I love the shit out of all of you. So I'm very comfortable <laughs> yeah. saying that on yeah. public record now. <laughs> right back at you, brother. Right back at you. You know, I, I one of the things that I'm always thoughtful about, because the, the, the year long program is a program. It, it's a big commitment by men. It's one thing to join a, a, a local men's group that you can come and go as you want. And maybe you'll go there for one meeting and maybe you'll go there for a month and maybe you'll go there for a year. But, 
but it's a whole other thing to actually jump off the cliff into a year long container. And, and what I'm curious about for you guys is what have you experienced in this year long container that has been different from what you've tried in the past? I think it was Brian that introduced the idea to me that there's always another layer. And so as we've individually been leaning into, you know, as, as you say, Tate, you know, cleaning up the wreckage of the past, right? So that we do, we do that descent work. Um, just being in a group for a year has allowed me to go many layers deeper, right? Like I, I didn't talk on, on this call about my, my, my birth father, but I know you all know that story. And I thought that story was pretty much resolved for me only to, to discover that the next layer and the next layer and the next layer were still profoundly impacting my life. And so I think, I think for me, that's like the ability to, to not just cover the wide range of, of topics that we cover, but then to be able to go deep in them, um, is probably the, the biggest change that I've seen over other groups is it, 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 this isn't just the surface level, right? Like I, I think of some other groups I've been in where the people show up for the weekly calls and that's like the mental masturbation that, Hey, I'm doing the work, but that's literally all they do. They, they show up for the calls. Right. And so th this has really given us the space and the, the, the guidance and direction to, uh, to go way deeper into this work than I've ever gone before. And for me, you guys know my work started with the UIR group, you know, and, you know, identifying problems as I related to relationships and came into relationships and, you know, the, the, the issues there, and it's still an external thing, but in doing that work, what it made clear to me was the deeper work that needed to happen internal to me had to be done in a different place. I had to come into doing that work brought me into the, the deeper conversation with myself around you're, you know, there's something still broken. So you have to fix, you have to go work on this thing, which is you, solely you. I think the piece that was uh, key for me, it's been different for me is, is actually just going back to that point on brotherhood. Um, and what I'll, what I'll call out in respect to that is when I was signing up for this and we were having our intake call, Tate, and I <laughs> mentioned this to you recently, uh, you know, Tate was telling me about how there's the screening process and we're going to make sure we find good men who are going to be able to really participate in this program. And in the back of my head, I was like, yeah, bullshit. You're just going to get whoever you can get to sign up for this thing. And, uh, you know, you're just going to throw them into the group and we're going to, it's going to be <laughs> whatever it's going to be. Um, at, at this point, I very much believe there is a, a screening process and that we are looking for people who are, you know, ready to commit to, um, to being here and doing the work. And that to me has made the difference. Yeah. Cool, Jeff. Thank you. The, the recipe of the creation I left to the, the alchemists that you guys are, you know, trusting in the process, I believe was the, the thing that I was told and that it, I believe that. Yeah. So I do, uh, clearly it has worked. Um, yeah. And so for me, the experience has been nothing more than way more than I could have hoped for. You know, I, I, I know that the calls that we have, and then there's a, you know, we're trying to decide things. And then, and then when it gets to a point of inviting you in, we make that invite. What we know is that th it is a threshold moment, that there's a threshold that, that your life has been conspiring to create. And it's meeting an opportunity to jump off of, of a metaphorical cliff. We know that it's a cliff. And I guess just to, to, to speak to what, what was the biggest fear or resistance that you guys had when you got to that metaphorical cliff? What, what, what did you have to confront, deal with, address, hold to be able to, to jump into something like this? You know, for me, it's, the fear of being seen, you know, and all my flaws and all of my, you know, imperfectness for, for that, you know, the, the idea that these men would bring out something that I was ashamed of, you know, that being here, I'd be ashamed of being here, showing up as my true self, my authentic self. You know, there's a huge fear of that. And it's like, holy crap, what are these guys going to think of me when I show up here? You know, how am I going to be received and looked at and all the things you, know, you you jump in with both feet and you, you have no idea, you know? So I think for me, that was one of the biggest hurdles. And it's also been one of the biggest reliefs too, to know that 
you know, my fear was not realized. Thank you, Jamie. I think for me, you know, I, I was pretty convinced. Um, I, I literally listened to one of your podcasts, Brian, with um, Adrian Grenier. Um, and it was actually an Instagram reel that my wife sent me that led, had led me to that podcast. And I listened to that and I applied. And then I actually got to meet Tate. We happened to be in the same area uh, around the time we were doing our intro call. So we, we met for coffee. And I, I immediately from those two experiences, I was like, all right, this is this is legit. Like, I'm, I'm ready for this. So my biggest fear was actually that. Um, that well, let me rephrase that. It wasn't I, I didn't say I'm ready for this. I, I, what I was, I was ready to make the, the, the I was ready to click by now. Right. And I was ready to go all in. But what I was afraid of is that I wouldn't be able to rise to the moment that I knew this was going to be a transformative experience if I was willing to do the work. And I, I remember writing it in, in kind of that intake form that what I was afraid of is that the, the, the answers that I was seeking would be in front of me and I wouldn't know how to grab them. Like, that's what I was afraid of is that I, I, and this goes back to that underlying that I, I wasn't capable. I wasn't worthy enough to have the things that I, that I wanted. And I, I was, I have a saying that, you want to walk through a minefield find the guy on the other side of the minefield and follow his footsteps or her footsteps right that's how i've conducted business for my whole my whole career and so i saw this group as having been through the minefield right you, you two gentlemen in particular have been through the minefield and so i i, I guess to, to follow that analogy one step further it was that i'd start walking in those footsteps and then didn't wouldn't feel like i belonged or didn't deserve or wouldn't be able to see or wouldn't know how to take that next step and so then I, I would ultimately not get to where I wanted to get to. Yeah. At some level, similar to what Jamie was saying, um, being willing to put myself out there. I know that in order to be able to move forward, be able to get the transformation, I need to be able to own where I really truly am. And would I be able to do that within this group? Um, and so for me, what it was uh, a lot of, and I guess the way that I, circumvented my fear because that's how I used to operate um, was I also have had this desire to, you know, explore coaching for myself, the, the career of coaching. And so I had gone to this other conference and while I was there, talked with some men about this idea of wanting to be a coach. They asked what my next steps would be. And so I was like, you know what? I've really respected Brian. So I'm going to go send him an email and just ask him if he would be open to sharing some advice or something like that. Um, and so then like within a day or two of getting back from that thing, I get an email from Brian about Elevate. And I was like, maybe the universe is trying to tell me something here, you know? <laughs> so, uh, so I started to look into it. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to see similar to Scott was just like during that intake call, like as I'm talking to Tate, am I getting a consistent message here? Right. Is this is this lining up with what I know, or what I have read and experienced so far of, you know, Brian's books and the Men This Way podcast that I had listened to at that point? Um, and everything felt consistent, felt congruent. And so for me, that was enough to be able to say, like, OK, I'm willing to take a shot here. Right. Like, I don't know that's going to work out and I'm, I'm willing to just take the shot and see where this goes. Yeah. That threshold moment for many men. Are, is really around um, around three things. One is, is it going to do more good than harm? <laughs> right? Like, do I do I believe that there's more good than harm inside of this? That's the first threshold that has to be, uh, uh, you know, live. The second is, am I really ready to do the work? Am I really ready to do the work? And the third is do I trust that it will work if I do do the work? Do I trust these guys enough to jump into this so that if, if I do do the work, I believe it's going to do more good than harm. I, I, I'm, I really am ready to go all in. Do I trust these guys to do it? And so, you know, for you guys, this is the last question, I guess that I have, Brian, you might have others, but to the, to the man that's listening to, to this, that, that might have misconceptions about men's work uh, that might be considering it might be thinking about whether or not he should jump into men's work. What would you say to that man? What I have found in that for myself and what men's work has meant for me has been like, this is the investment in the resource that for me is the most important in my life, right? Me, 
my own skills, my ability to show up, to be present in this world and the different areas of my life. Every area of my life, every area of my life since I have started on this journey um, and has been accelerated through the Elevate program has increased, ha has gotten better, has become elevated. Um, I feel more confident going into work. You know, I'm able to show up in meetings where normally I may have felt a lot of anxiety. And yeah, I still feel that anxiety, but now I have the skills to be able to manage that anxiety and show up present in the meeting, to show up present with the people that I'm working with to get to the right solutions. I have that ability to show up present with my kids, with my family, as I go and try to heal relationships that I have mishandled in the past. Like every step of the way, every aspect of my life, this is an investment in my own skill development so that everything else gets better. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. And, and for our listeners, uh, uh, we, we lost, uh, Jamie, he had to go do surgery. I don't know where his, his priorities are clearly not in the right place. Somebody's spine is on the line. He's got to go. He's got to go respine somebody. It, it, this is a, a, I think a bold statement. Um, in a lot of ways, but I, I, I've had this conversation with multiple men in this in this group. Um, joining Elevate is the single best decision I've ever I've ever made, like the single. And of course, you could say, well, what about your kids? What about your family? And what I would say to that is, you know, earlier in the call, I I met or this conversation. I mentioned that my wife and I there were years where she couldn't answer whether or not we're friends. And I I was I was explaining this to my kids because we talk now at much greater depth with our children. Uh, about communication and the importance of communication in relationship. And so while in front of my kids the other day, I asked my wife, are we friends? And she said, no, we're besties. So yes, my wife and children are the best things that have ever happened to me, but being able to connect with them at a level that I was never able to reach, uh, it, what, what is direct, like making this decision to join this program and to go on this journey with you men is what has unlocked that for me. And to your point, Jeff, you know, part of my purpose is to be emphatically and powerfully present and deeply connected with those that I love. And I wasn't able to do that before. And so I would spend all of this energy trying, trying to fill that gap and fill that void. And now I don't try. I'm, I, I just be, right? I don't have to try to support my wife when I'm present with her and I can see, hey, you know, we, she's not feeling well today. She's just not on her A game. Like how I serve our relationship is to step in and help that out. And it's not trying to, it's not taking energy from me to go do the dishes or, you know, uh, step into some of the school work. We homeschool our kids. Like I don't have to try those things. I just be. And, and so that, that is all a direct result of, of joining this, this program and, and going on this journey with you men. Just want to grab onto that for a second, Scott, because man, like you talking about spending all of that energy trying. <sighs> That was exhausting for me. <laughs> I, yeah. And the worst part of it all was at the end of the day, like my co-parent, my, my ex would, would say like, I don't feel like we've connected. And I'm like, what else can I do? God, just like the frustration that I felt in my body after trying all day to do whatever I could to build connection by doing things, <laughs> not, not by being present, but by doing things. Um, yeah, absolutely exhausting. So it, it it's life-changing man. <laughs> and that goes back to Je Jeff actually said one of the most profound things to me in this whole journey. Uh, it, he said it into the group. So I talked about a plus B equals C and Jeff and, and another gentleman made this distinction on a plus B equals M where M is marriage and a plus B equals R where R is your relationship. Like M and R are not the same thing. And so I'd put in all this trying into my marriage without realizing that I was completely leaving a void. And my wife would ask for things that were related to relationship. And I didn't know how to translate that. Right. So being able to have these skills and the communication to then go and be present, like all my wife and kids really want is my presence to be present with them when I'm with them. And I was completely incapable of doing that with any consistency six months ago. I think that's one of the greatest frustrations that we men tend to experience. As I shared, I was uh, speaking at this conference of surgeons this past weekend where uh, Jamie had invited me to. And I, I, I talked about that 
you know, it, it came up that you know, it was a very man heavy conference, as you might imagine. Um, uh, there were certainly many women there, but it was, um, you know, we heard men talk about all of the things that I'm doing on a daily basis, all the things that I'm holding together. I mean, it was, look, it was the same for the women too. I mean, there were women surgeons there that's, they're in the same mentality, right? And, and doing, 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 holding the world together, making all of this money, creating all of this structure for, for kids, for spouses, for, in some cases, extended family members to be cared for. And at the end of the day, they're both exhausted and, you know, to your point, Jeff, exhausted and still often feeling disconnected in their relationships. And I, I, I think that is, you know, in those moments, you know, Tate, you, you've had that, that moment with Elsa in the past. And by the way, I told that story, you know, the, 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 what the fuck do you mean? You don't feel connected to me. And we're sitting on the couch talking about our marriage in, in the house that we own together. <laughs> our kids are upstairs playing. What the fuck do you mean you don't feel connected to me? What does that even mean? You know, that exasperation is just so universal. And, and, and I, 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 what I'm, what I love, you know, you know, I just want you, you men to know, you know, first off, thank you for coming and, and being willing to have this conversation in this forum with us. Uh, this is you know, an experiment. Never know how th these things are going to go. Uh, never know how anything is going to go. I, we didn't know how Elevate was going to go. You know, we just, it's, it's all an experiment. But I feel so, so just so honored and so touched and moved and humbled. I mean, all the things. Uh, but what I, what I think I, one of the things I love the most is that we are, we are men stepping into a new way of being, not just figuring out how to do more doing for the sake of doing, right? Accumulating, achieving, accomplishing, nothing wrong with that. Obviously. I mean, that's. We're all, we got to do something with our lives and be about something. But what I've seen is, you know, in my line of work, there's, there's, there's a drive, you know, success looks like more followers, more impact, more, more money, more bigger platform, whatever. There's still this more, 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 more. And what I've seen at every level is it's never enough. There's no amount of impact that that fills that hole in 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 a, a man's heart <laughs> that says I'm not enough. There's no amount of money he can make. There's no amount of 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 you know companies he can build, et cetera, et cetera. And so what I just keep hearing echoed, you know, through you men, and it, it certainly confirms again, my, validates my own experience as a man is that again, all the doing is fine, but, but stepping into these ways of being this, 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 like feeling grounded in my body, grounded in my center, you know, connected to myself, you know, Jamie said it like I matter, you know, Scott and Jeff, you both have, have spoken to that, that really rich, powerful place of like, I'm here. I matter. And, you know, not from that, that, traditionally kind of arrogant, you know, I matter and no one else does. Right. But, but I matter and all, and also, and, and by the way, so does everyone else. It, it's such a, a new way of being in the world, I think for a lot of us men and, and the doing that then arises from that, the quality of the doing, the, the decisions we make, uh, I think are, you know, at the end of the day, just leave us with a fulfillment that is, is otherwise unattainable. I'm just reminded of a couple of weeks after a retreat, we had a, our first recap call or our first call, elevate call post retreat. And one of the gentlemen mentioned that he felt like time slowed down for him. And I, I echoed that. I sat with that. I talked with my wife about it. And my wife's explanation for it was pretty profound to me. And it was, you know, those deeply connected experiences. I had, I've had more of those not just since the retreat, they were the, the retreat wasn't just like this peak moment. And then I went home and had great experiences and then went back to old habits. It had been building up to that point, but then certainly going through the retreat and coming home, I've had more deeply connecting experiences with my friends. I didn't talk about this today, but my mother, as you guys know, we've had unbelievable growth in our relationship over the last few months. So more connected conversations and, and experiences in say the last four to six weeks. And I'd probably had in the last four to six years. 
And so when you think about those deeply impactful memories and experiences in your life, like that's why it feels like time has really slowed down because I used to go weeks or months between them. And now I might go minutes or hours. And so you talk about fulfillment. Cup overfloweth, Brian. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. So Tate, how, how do we wrap this up? Man, just a, a huge acknowledgement to you, Jeff, to you, Scott, to you, Jamie, and, and to the seven other men who will for now remain nameless. But, you know, for all the men out there in the world that are leaning in to live the biggest lives that, that are possible and willing to put, put themselves out there and reveal to a part of their world that there, there is something more that they're longing for, that they're hoping for, that they're willing to do the work for. I just celebrate each and every man who's in that spot, who is sick and tired of doing the same thing over and over again and, 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 and longing for them to be able to step into their greatness. I celebrate you. And, you know, look, we, we hope that if there's a guy that's inspired by this, we're going to be opening up applications for Elevate 2025. Obviously, if you're inspired to do this with us, we'd love to have a conversation with you to see if there's a fit. Uh, and for, for you, just men in general, to, to step into some kind of men's work, to, to, and, and at the very least, that guy that's in your life that you haven't shared the thing that you're really struggling with, to, to start there, if, you're, if, you've, if that's really the first place to begin, to just fucking do that to reveal what is hidden to another man that you trust or to step into a, a, a container that can, you know, Scott, you just said it beautifully that, that the growth of four to six years can happen in four to six weeks. If you're in the right container, find a container that can help fast forward your progress, your greatness, your fulfillment, your enlivenment, the support that you need to live the biggest life possible. Jeff, I will confirm for you tate does not invite everyone we do not invite everyone who applies you know there are we we get you know i don't know 50 to 100 applications every year for for elevate and uh we can only say yes to 10 men and and you know there are look it's it's not a criticism of men it's just you know we're just we're we are looking f we are curating an experience there's there's a, a because Tate and I we go deep with you men too i want to i want to enjoy the ride i don't want to i don't want to to go through a year of of life with 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 men that i'm not excited to go through life with so um uh you know there is there's an application process uh the you, you can get started if you're listening our website will be up by the time this is out uh, brianreeves.com slash elevate. It's Brian with a Y, reeves.com. I have to say that every time, guys. I have to because otherwise people will spell it with an I. They just will. Brian with a Y, reeves.com slash elevate. And uh, again, you know, Jeff, Scott, and, and Jamie, when you listen to this, uh, thank you guys so much. It, Scott, I love you too, man. Truly. You know, it, I, I love you. I love you, Jeff. Uh, I love... You know, what, one of the things I love most about Elevate is like I get all these, these, these a whole new group of men coming in in January that I just get to fall in love with over the, over the coming months, you know, to, to, because, you know, before doing this work, I didn't, I didn't trust men. I didn't feel safe with men. I didn't let men in. I didn't like men, but doing this work, getting to see the hearts of men over and over. Oh man, men are fucking awesome. We really are in the core and in, in our, in our core, we are, we're awesome. We're so cool. <laughs> we're, I love men. I love you guys. Yeah. Much respect, man. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for joining us on men this way today. Thank you for everything and for putting this together. And it has truly transformed my life and my kids and my mom and my wife and, and, and those ripples, right? Those ripples. Yeah. Those ripples, man.